songs we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you and Only there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and Hold me who you are and fill me With your heart and lead me In your love to those around me Well, good morning, Kettlebrook family. Troy here. You'll notice a couple things different about our gathering this morning. First of all, it's just me. Second of all, we are not at the Kettlebrook Community Center in West Bend recording. I'm recording downtown here, West Bend at the Norbert. My friend Tony is the owner here. I asked him if we could record here because it fits well into the message, I think, that we have for this morning. We are in a series called Equipped. And what we're doing is processing through how Jesus equipped his disciples to follow him and to live on mission for the sake of the kingdom of God. And if we're going to follow Jesus, we too need to be equipped. Equipped not only for this uh, life as we follow Jesus, but equipped for eternity and equipped to live out the kingdom of God ourselves. And so Jesus, we talked through, equipped his disciples with the Holy Spirit. And he equipped his disciples through prayer, through the word, in the scriptures and through, as we talked about last week, fellowship. This morning, I want to talk through another way that Jesus equipped his disciples. And I believe it's critical. It's equipping his disciples with story. Now, you might say, Troy, that's a strange thing for Jesus to equip his disciples with, but it's absolutely critical. When I think about this place, the Norbert, Sometimes I've been here before uh, to have dinner and, and it's just been absolutely packed. And is, it's probably because the food's great and, and the, the atmosphere is great, but there's something else going on. It's that people gather to share stories, to hear stories. Now, sometimes it takes a little liquid courage for some folks, but we want to share stories. We're a people of story. And so Jesus knew, knew this. That's why so much of what Jesus taught was through parables and through narratives and stories. And to prove how powerful story is, I want to actually begin by sharing a story with you. 
So if you want to sit back for a second and just engage in this story with me, you may want to close your eyes, but, but follow along with me as I share this story. The doorbell rang into the silence of the house. 30 seconds went past. The doorbell rang again. Now, what was not an uncommon sound throughout the day when perhaps a delivery driver would leave a package between the screen door and the front door and then ring the doorbell, what was maybe not uncommon because the neighbor boy would come over at times and ring the doorbell to see if their youngest son could come out and play, what was not typically uncommon throughout the day sounded hollow, eerie, and frightening when it came in the middle of the night. It rang out again a third time. Now, he wasn't real deep into his REM sleep, but it was deep enough to shockingly wake him out of it when he heard this noise. It was unpleasant, and his heart was racing. He'd wondering, he was wondering if he had been in a part of a dream. His heart was beating fast in his chest, and he could hear himself breathing quicker. It was dark in the bedroom, and the only light was from the blue LED on the side of his laptop indicating that on the dresser it had been plugged in. As he looked up, he couldn't really see the ceiling that well, but he knew he could hear his wife on his left breathing fast asleep. He could also feel the pointy elbow of his youngest son into his left thigh who had somehow must have made his way into their bed since when they had put him to bed hours ago. He lifted his head up slowly, trying not to wake his family, and he strained to hear anything and everything else in what otherwise was a dead silence of the night. He actually lowered his jaw, clearing out his ears to make sure he had the best of hearing. And then just as he began to convince himself that he had maybe been hearing things or had been dreaming, he heard a sound from downstairs that confirmed his anxiety. This time it wasn't the doorbell, it was a knock. A knock on the front door. He reached over to grab his cell phone, straining his eyes to see. He read it was 1.30 in the morning. And someone was indeed knocking at the door. A flood of thoughts began to fill his mind. Who could possibly be at the front door at this time of the night? This could not be good. He's like, is someone going to try to rob my house? And then he laughed at himself thinking, yeah, they're going to ring the doorbell and then plunder his house. He knew that wasn't it. Maybe someone had come to the wrong door and if he just waited a little bit longer, they would go away. Maybe it was the police. Oh, Lord, no. His mind immediately went to the thought of his oldest daughter, Abigail. Abigail, oh, Lord. Something happened to Abigail. She had just come home from college a couple weeks ago, and just earlier that night she had said she was going out with her friends. Where was she going? He couldn't remember. He heard the knock again on the door. His heart was beating in his chest so loud he could feel it. He could hear it in his ears as he reached over to grab his glasses. Staring up at the ceiling, he knew he had to do something. Looking over at his wife and child, Asking himself the question, how do I protect them? How is his daughter going to be protected? Is she okay? This could only be the worst. But he knew he had to do something. And so he reached the covers back and gently, as to not wake up his son and wife, stepped out of his bed, put his left foot down first, feeling the plush carpet beneath his toes, and then his right foot. He leaned out of bed, stood up, grabbed the bedroom door, quietly unlatched it, began to walk down the hall towards the front door, unlocked the top notch, looked around the side window to see who it was. Family, are you following me? Are you following me in this story? Are you tracking? You want to know what happens next, right? You kind of want to know. I'm not going to tell you what happens next. (laughs) Families, this is what stories do. Stories draw us in. They get us to, they, they, they draw us in, they, they cause us to enter in, and they cause us to buy in. Someone once said this, if you want someone to know the truth, 
you tell them, if you want someone to love the truth, tell them a story. I think Jesus, again, understood this very well, and that's why he taught so often through stories and parables. And this morning, I want us to enter into a story in Scripture. It's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. It's one of my favorites, and it's so rich, there's no way I'm going to come even close to mining all the gems that are in it, okay? So I want to give you a chance, though, to dig into it yourself, to dive into it yourself. And every week, we've been pausing to ask you to read the scriptures yourselves and ask a few questions. And that's very intentional. We're doing that so that you would become increasingly equipped yourself to engage with God's word and to be able to do this on an ongoing basis. Now, we've been asking the same questions every week, and that's because we want you to be able to replicate it and do it easily. Now, this week, I've got a few different questions for you. They're going to come up in just a minute. Um, I want you to wrestle through those questions after you read the text. But before you read the text and wrestle through it, I just want to take some time to pray. And then you'll read through it and answer these questions together, discuss or reflect. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you so much for your story. Thank you that you've made us a people who are a people of story. Father, I pray that this morning as we engage with your word, that, we would, that it would not return void. That's a promise that you made that I believe is very true. I pray now as, as my brothers and sisters open the word themselves, that you would speak to them by your spirit, that you would equip them directly yourself, and that you would do so for your sake and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, family, I hope you're able to find uh, up to five, if not more, stories within this story because everyone who is involved in this story brings their own story to the table. Now, the context here is that we've got Pharisees. And the Pharisees were the Jewish religious leaders, and they were trying to get a, a handle on who exactly Jesus was and what he was about. They knew he had done some really miraculous things, outrageous things. He's also said some crazy things. And so they want to find out more about him. So one of the Pharisees decides to invite him to his home for dinner. Why? Because when we share a meal, we can learn a lot about one another. It's where the stories play out so often. So... In verse 36, it says that Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, Dr. Ken Bailey, who's one of the foremost scholars on uh, the context of Jesus' time in the Middle East, says this. He says that basically in verse 36, there is a ton of important things missing from verse 36. And when I used to come to the Norbert when it was open before this whole COVID-19 thing happened, if Steph and I would come, for example, for dinner, we would be greeted. I'm going to be greeted by the host or hostess. Sometimes it was Mr. Dallin, who uh, works with my kids at McLean as well. Uh, I get to play basketball with him from time to time. And so Mr. Dallin, maybe, he would open the door for us. He didn't have to ask my name. He knows my name, kind of like a cheers thing. Um, he would take down our name, make sure that we uh, are comfortable, maybe say, hey, you want to wait at the bar while we get a table ready for you. Do all the things that good service and hospitality uh, demand. But if we were to take hospitality in our culture here, it is nothing compared to the hospitality that was expected in the Middle East during this context that Scripture was written. So what we find is that um, we, we, we don't know it from verse 36, but basically Jesus is sort of humiliated. And the reason why is because even the most customary of hospitality, the hospitality was denied to him. For example, he wasn't offered water to wash his hands or feet. Uh, typically, oil would have been for either washing your hair or hands. Like There would have been a, a variety of things that would have happened before he would go to the table. These things seem to be denied. We don't know that from verse 36, but verses 44 and 45 confirm. Jesus says, hey, I came here and you didn't do this and you didn't do this and you didn't, you didn't do the things that typically are done. And so there's already conflict in the story in verse 1 of this story. But the plot thickens in the second verse where we find this. There is a woman who has made herself uh, or found her way into the room and she has uh, lived a sinful life. Now, the fact that she's made her way into this room reveals that it's a fairly open public uh, event because sometimes they would allow people who are on the fringes to come along the sides uh, of the room in an event like this and, and it's almost like gleaning, if you would, on the sides. But um, we find she's there and, and so she 
uses, she comes up behind Jesus and she is bawling. She is weeping. And she, she comes down and she uses her tears to, to basically wipe Jesus' feet, uses her hair to wipe with her own tears. And then she anoints his feet with perfume. And this all happens in, in, in the ways that Jesus was slighted by the Pharisee that invited him there. This woman now almost embarrassingly reveres him and honors him. And the Pharisees are watching him let her do this to him. And so the host then says to himself, probably what everyone else in the room is thinking, and that is, if Jesus knew who this woman was, if he knew how sinful she was, how unclean she was, he wouldn't even let her, let her, let her touch him. He must not know who this woman is. You see, family, into every story we bring our assumptions, we bring our presuppositions. I want to give you an example of this. I took a class with a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Nabil Jabour, and he gave this great illustration I want to share with you. I want to put a phrase up. It'll come up on your screen. And it's just some words right now. This is a phrase. And what I want you to do is I want you to take, take a minute. You probably have to pause here. I just want you to try to punctuate. There's no punctuation in this phrase right now. I want you to punctuate this phrase. Okay? So maybe you have to hit pause. I would encourage you to do so and just punctuate this phrase before you hit play again. Now, you will notice that there are a couple ways that you can actually, well, hopefully you notice, there's probably a couple ways you could punctuate this phrase. The first way you could punctuate it, for example, is like this. A woman without her man, comma, is nothing, period. A woman without her man, comma, is nothing, period. Now, women, ladies, hopefully you haven't checked out at this point. It gets better. Try this. There's another way to punctuate it, and it looks like this. A woman colon, without her, comma, man is nothing. A woman, colon, without her, comma, man is nothing. See how, how different just the punctuation is, but we bring our assumptions, we bring our presuppositions to the table. And so when this woman comes and honors, tries to honor and revere Jesus in this way, the Pharisees already have their minds made up. They've already got their assumptions about her. And so how does Jesus respond? You, you know how he responds? He responds by telling a story. And so he says, hey, Simon, let me tell you a story. There are two guys. And both of them owed a man some money. And, and just because the number is 500, obviously, he's, one of them owed a man 500 bucks. The other one owed 50. Now the guy who, they, neither of them could actually pay this guy back. The guy who was owed the money found it out and knew it, and he said, you know what, I forgive you both of your debts. You, neither of you owe me the money. And Jesus says, which of those do you think will love the guy who forgave his debt more? And Simon, being caught up in the story, knew the answer. And so he said, I suppose, I suppose the one who owed more. And Jesus says, you have judged correctly. You see, Jesus tells this story to engage Simon in the truth of it. So, so then Jesus points to this woman and points out how well she was loved by him and contrasts them together. He's like, you didn't give me any water, she used her tears. He's like, you, you, you didn't give me a kiss even, she's been kissing my feet the whole time. You haven't anointed with me oil, she's using perfume for crying out loud. And then as if everyone's minds have not been blown enough already by this scene, Jesus then says this, her many sins are forgiven. Now he doesn't notice this. He doesn't deny that she had sinned. He doesn't say, oh, I don't care about her sins. He says, her many sins are forgiven. They're forgiven. But even though he had just said that out loud in front of everybody in the room, he then takes the time to look at her. He hasn't actually said anything to the woman up to this point yet in the, in the entire story. He hasn't said anything out loud. But he looks at her now, even though he just said it out loud and forever, he says, her many sins are forgiven. He looks now at her and he says, your sins are forgiven. And when Jesus says this, everyone in the room who, who up to this point, the scene of the story was, was kind of like on Jesus and then the woman and maybe Simon. Now the whole room pans out and asks, and you see everyone's faces asking the same question, who can forgive sins but God, right? 
Who is this man who can even forgive sins? But because Jesus is the one who starts the story, he's also the one who ends it. And he says this to her. He says, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. This is an amazing story. And again, I have just scratched the surface of it. Now, there's, I think, a, a number of things that we can take and apply from this story into our lives. But before we do this, I want to actually have us engage with the story in a different way. I want to do it through songs. These songs so often tell stories as well, don't they? There's a song by uh, uh, Ren Collective called Alabaster. And what I want you to do now is, uh, is just wrestle through and think through the words of this song. Reflect in the words. If you know this song, you can sing along with it. That's okay. But this song was written by Ren Collective to put us a little bit into the scene of this specific story. It's called Alabaster. So take some time and see the story through the eyes of this song as well. at your feet like an alabaster jar every piece of who I am laid before your majesty I will bow my life at your feet, at your feet, my lips so lost for words will kiss your feet, kiss your feet, yeah. The gravity of you It draws my soul unto its knees I will never be the same I am lost and found in you Oh, I will bow my life at your feet, at your feet. My lips, so lost for words, will kiss your feet, kiss your feet. I will bow my life, oh I will bow my life at your feet, at your feet. My lips, so lost for words, will kiss your feet, kiss your family, I hope you had a chance to engage in that story through that song. Very often songs, again, tell stories. That's why we so can connect with songs. But I, I hope that you understand that Jesus equips his disciples with story. And in light of that, I think there are three questions this raises for us. The first question is this, do you know other people's stories? Do you know other people's stories? I think about, again, this place, and I think about what it would look like when this opens up again for, for us to be a people who listen well to other people's stories. 
I've noticed that I think we're getting worse at listening to others. Not only that, are we getting worse at it? I think furthermore, we, we, engage, we engage stories as if we have to see ourselves at the center of every story. I was just listening to a message by Francis Chan. He had this great illustration, tells a story about how when he was young, he would ride with his friends a bike, their bikes up to this place where there was a waterfall. And they would sit and just watch and be amazed at the waterfall. Today, what we do when we get to a waterfall, the first thing that we do is we pull our cameras out and we go like this. And we put ourselves in the center of that story. It's not about the waterfall anymore. It's about, hey, look at me. I'm at the waterfall. This is how we see stories, as if we're at the center of all those stories. That's why I think we're not quite as good at listening to other people's stories, because we're not at the center of them. In Luke chapter 7, verse 44, Jesus then asks this other question that convicts me every single day. And it almost seems like a silly question because he turns to Simon the Pharisee and he asks this question. He says, do you see this woman? Now, Jesus doesn't ask silly questions, but it does seem like a silly question to me. He says, do you see this woman? Of course he sees the woman. Everyone in the room is looking at the woman. She is the, actually at the center of attention, quite frankly, what she's doing. She's been bawling. She's been making a scene. Do you see this woman? Of course, Jesus, I see this woman. And yet, he doesn't. He doesn't see her. All he sees when he looks at her is he sees her sins. He sees his own self-righteousness in comparison to her. He sees her his presuppositions, his assumptions. That's what he sees. But Jesus saw her. Simon didn't really know her story. Jesus saw her. And actually, Jesus saw Simon too. Because Jesus, it says, knew what he was, th- he knew what he was thinking. He knew Simon's story too. Families, if we claim to follow Jesus, we have to be a people willing to see other people, to truly see them. As we hear their stories, we want to see people and, and truly see them. And there's no better time, I think, than to do that than today. You know, Simon kind of wanted Jesus to be socially distant from that woman because she was unclean. But Jesus wanted Simon to see her, to not be distant from her. People today, as we wear masks around, we're guided to be physically distant from people. But that doesn't mean that we can't see people for their humanity. More and more what I'm seeing is that people will walk by without even making eye contact with one another. Look Look people in the eyes, family. Say hello. Even if they don't reply, just say, hey, you're acknowledging they're a human. You're acknowledging they're made in the image of God. Can we do the simple things of trying to see people and not look past them, look beyond them? Do we see others? So here's a question. Whose story are you going to learn about today? We can do it even at six feet. We can hear people's stories. And many people are wrestling with their own stories right now. It's a great time to do it. Second question. First question is, do you know other people's stories? Second question is, do you know the bigger story? When I think about stories, I think about, uh, again, people attaching their stories to the bigger story or to, or to a bigger story. And I think about zip lines. We have a zip line in our backyard, but I'm thinking more of like big, big zip lines where you go through the forest, treetops, or down the jungle, or wherever. If you've ever done that, you go and you get suited up, okay? If you're a guy, it's like, <laughs> anyway, so you, you get on this, <laughs> you get on this platform, you climb up, and they, they take your carabiner or whatever, and they, they secure you to this line, and you ride this zip line from point A to point B. And sometimes there's someone next to you in a different line. And so I, I see that right now. As, as these bigger narratives that we're carabining, carabinering ourselves to. I, we all do this, whether you acknowledge it or not. You take yourself and you secure yourself to a larger story, okay? Some of you, for example, have taken your carabiner and you have hooked yourself up to a narrative in this COVID-19 thing. And some of your narratives, it's, they're a little fearful. It's a, it's a fearful narrative that perhaps that coronavirus and the whole COVID-19 thing is a complete conspiracy theory. And this whole thing's been made up and there's all kinds of, actually, quite frankly, fear around that. Our rights are going to be taken away and all that. Um, some of you have taken a different narrative and you've secured your carabiner to the narrative of until a vaccine is found, like we're all going to die, like we're super scared, we can't talk or look at anybody. Uh, some of you have secured your carabiners to different narratives that maybe are somewhere in between th- those narratives. But when we do this, we forget there's actually a larger narrative at play. 
When we, when we do this, we forget there's actually a larger narrative, a larger story that we're actually meant to be hooked to, and it's the story of the kingdom of God. It's a story where God is bigger than all these smaller narratives, that He is in control, that He has made all this, and He's the only way out of all this. And again, Ken Bailey brings some great insights from our text this morning. He says this. I'm going to put this up on the screen so you can read it with me. He says, obviously, the room was occupied with two types of sinners. There's the law keepers and the law breakers. The entire scene unfolds within the tensions that develop between these two kinds of people. Law keepers often condemn law breakers as sinners. Law breakers generally look at law keepers and shout, hypocrites. But not in this story. Here the woman's total focus is on Jesus. See, Jesus is bigger than this story. He is the bigger story. He is the center of every story in that room back then and every story in the room that you're in today. He is at the center of it. And he doesn't deny it. In 1865, April 4th, it was the end of the Civil War. And President Abraham Lincoln had made it a point that he was going to visit the capital of the South. It was still kind of in ruins and still burning, quite frankly. It was Richmond, Virginia. And so he, he took some time and he went to visit uh, Richmond, Virginia. And according to author David Burke, here's what happens. When he goes down there, it says, Upon arrival, he, pointed, he was pointed out to a former slave. And the slave rushed to the president, fell on his knees, and began to kiss Lincoln's feet. Embarrassed, Lincoln replied this. I'm going to put this up for you. He said this. That's not right. You must kneel to God only and thank Him for liberty. If even President Lincoln knew he wasn't supposed to have someone come bow before him and kiss his feet, then why doesn't Jesus stop this woman from making this scene, especially in front of all these religious leaders? He just lets her do it. Why? Because he's actually affirming and confirming who he was. That he is God in the flesh. That he had come for both the law breaker and the law keeper. He had come for both the unrighteous and the self-righteous. That we can't find peace by either trying to keep the law or trying to break the law. Neither of those will give us peace. Only in him. If we, like this woman, come before Jesus on our knees perhaps through tears, he says, go in peace. If we can come before him, he can give us freedom, true freedom, freedom from sins, the sins of unrighteousness, the sins of self-righteousness. And so I want to ask you this question. Have you done that? Have Have you come to Jesus as this woman has on your knees? Have you come to offer yourself fully to him? Letting go of and unclipping from these smaller narratives and clipping yourself to the bigger story, God's kingdom. If not, then why not? What is keeping you from doing that today, right now? Jesus can see you just as he saw this woman. Just as he saw Simon. He saw both her sins of unrighteousness and his sins of self-righteousness. He knows what you're already thinking. And so bring yourself to him and ask you to forgive him or ask him to forgive you and he will. And you will finally be able to go in peace, in peace in the midst of anything that's going on. You will be able to have peace. Number three, the first is, do you know other stories? The second is, do you know the big story? The third is, do you know your own story? And this is simply this, do you know, do you know your own story? Can you share your own story? Have you ever written out your own story? And the next question is, is Jesus the hero of your story? Because if he's not, you haven't quite entered into the biggest line yet. You haven't hooked up to the right carabiner to to the biggest line yet. Because he is the hero of your story. That's what you were made for to know, that he's the hero of your story. So my challenge to you would be to write out your story and actually share it with someone. Someone that's willing to listen to you and share how Jesus is the center of your story. So what I want you to do now is I want you to take some time to pause and reflect As we close, there's three discussion questions I want to run past you. You'll see them on the screen before you. And after that, we're going to sing a song together that tells its own story. It tells the story of the bigger story. It's called Death Was Arrested. And it tells the story of basically the kingdom of God and what it all means for us. So let's reflect, let's sing, and then we'll come back together for a conclusion.
Family, I pray that um, you are encouraged today, that you're encouraged by the story, 
by the big story and then the stories within the story that Jesus continues to unfold for us and show who he is in and through those that we might know the kingdom of God, that we may be engaged in God's kingdom, that we too may be able to, through faith in Christ, go in peace. Some of you are going to press me a little bit and say, Troy, what happened with the story? The first story of the guy going down the hall to open the door at 1.30 at night. I'm not going to tell you the end of that story. I'm not sure it matters. But what's super encouraging about the big story is that we actually know how it ends. We know how it ends. If we were to go ahead, we know from the book of Revelation how this plays out. And, and the story of the woman at the feet of Jesus, something else that really struck me that I didn't say earlier was this. As I thought about it and read about it, what's interesting is that she uses her tears to wash his feet, but then she uses her hair to wipe his feet. Why? Certainly she would have been wearing a robe or a dress. There was plenty of cloth around for her to use to wipe his feet. Why does she use her hair? Jewish women did not take their hair down. And then she takes her hair down and washes his feet with them. Well, there's only one time a Jewish woman would take her hair down. And it was on the night of her wedding. So this woman knew that she was at the feet of the king. She took her hair down. And I don't know what her sins were, but they probably involved other men. I don't know. But she's saying, this is the only one for me. He is the one. He is the king. And what's amazing about that is at the end of the story in Revelation chapter 21, we're going to fast forward. It says, then I saw a new heaven, a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And they heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. She used her tears to wipe away the dirt on Jesus' feet, knowing that he is the king. And one day he will wipe away every tear himself, making all things new. May we take and secure ourselves to his story, the story of the kingdom of God, made available through faith and faith alone in his son, Jesus Christ. Know this and go living in light of this, listening to others, knowing his story and sharing our stories as well. Let's do it together, family. God bless you. Amen.